Greetings, everybody. Bob Lusk here, the Pond Boss. Coming to you from World Headquarters, the Pond Boss Magazine, nestled up here along the Red River, north of Sherman Gainesville area, north of Whitesboro, Texas. Uh, looking forward to having a little talk with you tonight. Tonight's topic, we're going to talk about why bass do what they do. Bass behavior. That ought to be pretty fun. So uh, start kicking your questions at me. In the meantime, I've got a few topics. We've had a couple of questions come in over the week. And we're going to uh, see if we can tackle that. Before we really get too far into it, got to tell you about Pond Laws Magazine. If you're not a subscriber and you've got a pond or a lake, you need to be a subscriber to Pond Boss. It's good stuff. I see Todd Watts is on board. Hello, Todd. Hope you're not freezing to death up there in Hurricane, West Virginia. And in today's talk, you know, talking about largemouth bass, going to have a whole lot of fun because the thing about largemouth bass is... In the ponds where they live, they're typically the dominant predator, you know. And the thing about that is that uh, you got to understand a little bit how they act, what makes them do what they do. So I'm going to take a minute here and see if I can get this live feed up on my laptop so I can see your questions a little bit easier. And then we'll get right into this topic. So... Got my laptop in front of me and see if I can't get this video up where I can see it. There we go. There we go. I got it now. Got it. Okay. So let's start talking about largemouth bass. I see Mike Rivers is on board. And the first thing I'd like for you guys to do, if you don't mind, is right now, if you don't mind, share the video with your friends list. If you do that, I would appreciate it. You know, last week we asked folks. Hey, Scott Lindsay, good evening to you, buddy. Glad you're on board. You know, last week what we did was uh, I asked you to do two or three things, and several of you did. And I think it's I think we're going to do the same thing tonight. I know Jacob West isn't on board yet, but he's going to be fun to find out that uh, he won a hat and a mug, a Pond Boss mug. So here's what you got to do to be in the drawing for that is to, if you don't mind, in the comment section, put hashtag Pond Boss Magazine, click like on Pond Boss Facebook page, and then share, share the video. And if you'll do that, as soon as we see the hashtag Pond Boss Magazine, then Leanne will pay attention to that. She'll have a drawing and we'll get it done. Jason Nepstad's on board. Hey, Jason, glad to see you're on. Kevin Briggs is with us today. Hello, Kevin. All right, I'm going to get into this, and I'll keep greeting people as they come on, but what I want to talk about is why bass do what they do. You know, the, the thing that we got to remember about pretty much any fish is that they, that, they, that they act based on instinct and conditioning. Now, where I'd like to start with that is bass, for example, instinctively know that they need to spawn so they can carry on the species. They know that they're predator fish. That's instinctive. You know, they have kind of a, a fight mentality. That's instinctive. So there's a number of things about bass and fish as a whole that are instinctive. That's just, that's just their instinct. The rest of it is conditioning. So they get conditioned to their environment. Um, when a bass grows up in a certain environment, they get conditioned to that environment. And I've had a number of people over the years say, well, hey, I, I caught a bunch of fish out of this pond over here. I caught them out of Lake Fork, and I brought them over here in this lake, but I don't ever see them. Well, that's because those fish get conditioned into that environment, and if you switch environments and bring them into another one, that doesn't mean they're gonna make the, that they're going to make the switch. Let's see, we got, uh, holy cow, we got a lot of folks jumping in. There's Anthony Abate. See, Richard, Clark, John. Jim Liner, Alex Short's on board. Glad you got it. Yeah, let's get this. Yeah, let's get this shared. Please do. Okay, so now when we start talking more about bass, let's just start off as an egg. When a, when a female bass lays eggs and the, what, when, they, when they begin to breed, what happens is the male builds a nest, and typically it's a crater. It could be in an old tree stump. It might be in six feet of water, and it might be in three feet of water. But it's one nest with one male bass who's defending that nest. Then the female comes in, and he may spawn with five or six females. It depends on 
how many are right with eggs and ready to go. So he may have a nest that's got eggs from several females in there, and then he'll guard those eggs while the female goes away. And uh, she may go spawn in another nest. So that's part of nature's way of keeping the the, the uh, species from interbreeding, you know, from you, to, to avoid that. So now that little egg hatches. When the egg hatch, let's just, just for numbers sake, let's say that, uh, that there's 50,000 eggs in one nest, which is, that's not uncommon. That's not unusual for that many to be there. Well, when those eggs begin to hatch, they're little bitty fry that they're maybe about twice as big as the head of a pin. And as they hatch, they're yellow. And then they, you can see two little bitty black dots under the eye. And if you look real close, you can see a short body in what is the yolk of the egg. And over the next few days, those babies absorb the yolk of the egg. That's their nutrition. And then once that happens, then they'll turn into what's called swim up fry. And they'll swim up from the nest. And that's when those five or six days in the spring, maybe two or three times in the spring, you'll see just little groups of bass, maybe in a wad this big and there may be 25 to 50,000 of them in one school and they'll migrate up to the shore what's happened is the male has pushed them off the nest their dad's pushed them off the nest that's fair game he may eat some of them because the whole world changes once they come off the nest so they head for shallow water and since they haven't eaten they don't have any body fat so their first thing they do instinctively is to start feeding on microscopic plants and animals primarily zooplankton if zooplankton is available, they'll feed on that. And that's when those instinctive predatory uh, things that they do, that's when it really starts to kick in and they start to do it. I see Mike Rivers is on board. Katie Ferguson from Alaska. Wow, hi, Katie. Good to see you. Glad you're here. So what we're talking about is now the swim up fry come up in a pretty big school and then they start to move around. They move around the pond. They get up usually in shallow water. And at that point, all hell breaks loose. <laughs> All the other predators are chasing those fish, wanting to eat them. So their survival rates are typically pretty low because in nature, the parent's mission is just to replace themselves. You know, So as those fish get a little bit bigger, even though those little bitty fry are feeding mostly on zooplankton and bugs, the bigger they get, the bigger their mouth becomes. The bigger their mouth is, the bigger the meals. And some of those little fish in that school are gonna grow at much, much faster rates because they're more aggressive they figure out how to live in that situation. They figure out how to feed in that situation. So when that begins to happen, you start to see some fish in our, in our business, we call them jumpers, because they jump up and get bigger. It's not unusual after about three to four weeks to see some bass that long coming from a typical school where the rest of them are that long. Well, that fish that's this big can turn around and eat all of his brothers and sisters and cousins, and they will. So now that the little Fingerlings are starting to get to be four inches, five inches long. Now they're probably eight weeks old, 10 weeks old when they're five or six inches long. There's a not nearly as many as there was. Katie Ferguson says, when are you coming back up to the Walker compound? I don't know, but I love that. That was a lot of fun. So since you just invited me, we'll put it on the calendar. <laughs> Alaska is a great, great fun place to be. So as these bass swim up and they start getting bigger, their habits change. Their behavior changes. When they're six inches long, seven inches long, they're just as instinctively concerned about getting eaten as they are what they can eat. So they're not only fighting to, for food, they're fighting to hide and keep from being eaten. And over the next three or four weeks, their numbers drop even more exponentially. So out of that original school of 50,000 eggs, and then 40,000 babies or whatever they are, it gets drilled down from that one school to maybe 100 young ones that are six or eight inches long. And by the fall, in a perfect world, they'll be 10 to 12 inches long, and there might be 15 or 20 of those out of that school. So their numbers drop. Well, part of what I wanted to talk about is, is, is instinct compared to conditioning. So you can imagine that these little fish, when they come off the nest, and they start to feed, they become accustomed to whatever is available in that pond. They get accustomed and conditioned. When I say conditioned, it's the same thing as Pavlov's dogs. You know, when you take your dog and, and you say, sit, give him a treat. Sit, give him a treat. These fish are the same way. So they get in there and, and they start getting conditioned 
to that environment, that habitat, and that situation, that water chemistry. And so the fish that are genetically predisposed and have the opportunity to thrive in that environment, they will if they don't get eaten. You know, that's the catch-22 in a bass world. Now, remember this. I've mentioned this in other, other broadcasts. This is something I always want to drive home. It takes about 10 pounds of bait fish for a largemouth bass just to gain one pound. 10 pounds of bait fish. You know, so they're constantly on the prowl to eat. Well, as they do that, they become more conditioned. As they get bigger, they don't get confident. They get conditioned to where the bigger they get, the less likely they are to be eaten. So then they can start dominating certain habitats, certain structure and cover and things like that. So they'll, you know, when, it, when a fish gets bigger, a bass gets bigger, say a, a pound and a half or two pounds in their second year, then they start to dominate some of the more preferred areas of habitat. So they might be hanging out by that log unless there's a six pound bass over there that doesn't want them to, you know, or they'll get eaten. So the conditioning is a big, big deal. Um, and there's a number of things, you know, as, as anglers, I'll t let me tell you this. Everybody watching me can outfish me. I promise you, you can. You can, if you said, hey, let's go bass fishing, I'm going to be watching you because I'm going to learn something from you. But I don't know that there's very many of you watching this can, that can beat me when it comes to raising those fish that you're trying to catch. That's my, that's my deal. I love to do that. It's really fun. And part of, the, part of the things that have made it fun is that I've had a chance to get out there and study these fish through different eyes than an anger. I get to see them with, through the electrofishing boat. You know, I get to see them when we, when we build structure and run the electrofishing boat over that structure. Where's the fish? Or they're good gosh, here they all are. You know, and by building lakes and then coming in a few years and draining them. Uh, you know, just to see how it's worked. I have a chance to do that. This is my 39th year of doing this. And it gets more and more, more and more fun. Hey, <laughs> sorry about that. My phone started ringing. I thought I had it on airplane mode. Anyway, um... So, as a student of this fish thing, it's just fascinating the things I get to learn compared to what somebody in a boat above the water gets to learn. So I want to share a little bit more about that. I guess one of the, where I want to go next is some of the physiological things about largemouth bass, even though that's a big word. They're instinctively conditioned to that environment by their sense of smell their vision, uh, their lateral line. The lateral line, that's a good place to start. Lateral lines, what that does is that's that line that you see across the middle of a fish that starts behind its gill and goes all the way to its tail. Now that lateral line is a, a hollow tube, kind of like a vein. And what it does, is got gas in it. So when there's any movement in the water, the lateral line senses that and then sends an impulse to the brain of the fish and the fish is then instinctively knows to either move to, move away, based on conditioning. It knows it needs to react some way. Uh, barometric pressure change, then when that happens, they sense it through their lateral lines. You know, and so the lateral line is, is one of the sensory mechanisms that a fish has. And now largemouth bass, keep in mind, here's nothing, something real important that I don't know that a lot of people think about, but a largemouth bass doesn't have the ability to think. It can't think. It becomes conditioned. It's got, it's, it, it's not like it can sit where it is and look around and say, well, you know, there's a bunch of bluegill up there and there's a bunch of shad over there. It can't do that. They, a bass can't reason. And it, it just, to me, it's kind of fun when you start thinking about how much time we spend as anglers trying to outsmart an animal that can't think. <laughs> you know, so as we're doing, as we're out there in the boat trying to figure out how to catch that beast, we're trying to outthink it. Well, I think sometimes we overthink it when we try to outthink it. But I'm going to give you some of those variables that influence bass behavior. You know, when, they, when you start thinking about their sight, bass are sight feeders. But some of the biggest bass I've ever electrofished came out of water you couldn't see six inches in. You know, so what that tells me is those fish in that muddy water have become conditioned to that water so they can't depend on their vision they have to depend more on their lateral lines. 
So when they sense me, there, another dead gun, my granddaughter's trying to FaceTime me. She has no idea and I didn't turn this thing on, on airplane mode. Oops. So anyway, the, uh, when the bass, when the, when the bass sense movement in muddy water, they're going to be more likely to come investigate that movement because that's how they're going to get to eat. So if you're fishing muddy water, for example, you need to use something that makes a lot of noise. You know, it needs to, you know, rattle trap or something that's making a lot of noise would be the way to fish for bass in muddy water. Let's see, Craig McBride's on board. Hey, Craig, Robert Geeson, and Leanne is tuned in. Glad to see you guys. Looks like we got about 26 people on right now. That's good, 27 now. Good, good. So, when you're thinking about bass thinking, rethink it. <laughs> because they can't do that. What you gotta figure out is what can I do to make those fish bite? So there's, here's some behaviors for you. There's really only three reasons a largemouth bass will bite. Raise your hand if you know what they are. Oh yeah, okay, yep, yep, okay, yep, there we go. All aquatics, hello there. A bass, a largemouth bass bites for one of, or all three, for three reasons. Number one is they're hungry. And I wanna talk about that here in a minute. Number two is they're reacting. So there's movement, they sense it. They sense it with their lateral line. If they don't see that bait or don't see that school of fish or whatever it is that causes them to, to move, make them move, they sense movement. So when they sense that movement, they'll turn and then they'll go investigate. They almost always investigate up, especially in warmer water. Now in colder water or hot water, that doesn't hold true. But most of the time when they're actively feeding, they investigate up to go eat. The second reason that they'll strike is the reaction strike. The reaction strike, no, feeding, feeding, reaction, but they're reacting to movement almost every time. And the third time, the third reason they'll bite your hook is to defend a nest or defend a territory. If, if there's a big bass laying beside a log, it doesn't want anybody coming in there messing with it. They'll go run it off. You know, I've, I've actually watched a bass, a female bass that was spawning with a male bass on a bed just for fun. I threw a worm out there. I've done this several times. And one of those fish will pick the worm up and just move it out of the nest. They won't swallow it. They won't put it in their mouth where you can, where you can set the hook. They'll just pick it up and they'll move it. You know, so the three things, feeding strikes, reaction strikes, and defending a, a territory. Now, let's, let's tackle feeding. Fish behave feeding because they're hungry. And that's instinctive. And then they're conditioned to the food chain that's available at that moment in that area. And during different seasons, that food chain changes because fish spawn, fish get eaten, fish spawn again, fish get eaten, some fish grow, come in there where they don't belong, they get eaten. So keep that in mind when you're thinking about feeding. Now, here's the thing about feeding. A large mouth bass, let's say, let's say we have a, 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 a three and a half pound bass that eats a 10 inch bass. That 10 inch bass is gonna, in, in warmer water, probably is gonna take that bigger fish two days to digest, maybe even a little bit longer. But that doesn't mean that that big bass won't be hungry and hit another lure because it's, it can, you know? So think about that now. Out of that feeding process, when you start thinking about the feeding, now my videos quit. When you think about feeding, they don't eat all day long. They may come in and feed for 30 seconds. You know, they may leave the safety of that area where they are, go feed. They might, they're going to find their food, they're going to inhale it quick, and then they're going to go back to where they were. And that's where they're going to hang out for the other 23 hours, 59 minutes for the most part. Now, the bigger the fish, the more likely they are to, they are to do that. Okay, you know what? we got a question. looks like Jason Nepstad says, when removing bass from lakes to keep the population in check, we typically remove what we catch fishing. Are we removing the more aggressive fish and leaving the less aggressive? Would it be better to remove fish via electrofishing? Yes, that's true. Uh, aggressiveness is, is genetic. It's inherited. There's been a number of studies around that uh, proves that up. So 
if if you're going to harvest fish exclusively by angling, then my recommendation would be this. Pay attention to the lengths and weights. The reason you want to harvest fish is because they're getting overcrowded. When they get overcrowded, you've got too many fighting for the same space in a, in a limited food chain. And in that case, the most aggressive fish are going to be the ones that are growing the best, that are getting bigger quicker. So judge their body condition. If you catch a fish that fought extra hard, you pull it up, and it's got a deep body, thick shoulder, and then fat around the tail, even though it may fit into your slot limit that you've decided that you're going to uh, harvest, Go ahead and take, leap, throw those back, those big fat chunky fish, put those back in the lake. But if you catch one that's 75% uh, of what it should weigh, 80% of what it should weigh, take it out. But to answer your question is yes. Let's see, Robert says, Ken Milam always told me anything under 15 inches and take it out. That's a pretty good rule of thumb, you know, especially in lakes where the bass are really, really crowded. You know, taking them out, but at the same time, what Ken, and Ken knows this as well, Ken Milan, by the way, is radio show host, uh, um, the Sunday Sportsman, and he's got a Saturday show on 1300 The Zone out of Austin. He has me on as a guest pretty often. So uh, on Saturdays and Sundays, you can tune in. He's on Saturdays from 5 in the morning to 8, and on Sundays, 6 to 8. He's got a good show. If you want more details, email me at info at pondboss.com, and, and I'll tell you more about it. But uh, when you're going back to Jason's topic, as you're harvesting those fish, let's, let's say you're, that your lake is overcrowded now, and it has been for a while. Start culling. Cull, cull, cull. And once you get to the point that you've reduced the numbers of bass enough that the remaining fish begin to grow, then you can start judging which fish to harvest and which ones not to. Nick Peterson, hey Nick, fisheries biologist. He says, hey Bob, great to hear bass talk again. Brings me back to my largemouth bass studies with Dr. Willis at SDSU and Dr. Neal at Mississippi State. All set up and supported by the great folks at Pond Boss and the Jesse West Research Scholarship. I'm enjoying these videos. Keep them coming. Nick, great to hear from you, man. Wish I could spend some time with you. You know, Dave Willis was one of my very dear, I, I, I call him my best friend ever. And uh, I still grieve over that. I'm just, I wish he was still around and Dr. Neal, man, what a superstar. That guy's fantastic. So uh, glad to hear that you're on. Chris Dobbs, glad you're on, buddy. So we're talking about largemouth bass tonight. So the question on the table is about culling some fish and taking out the, the most aggressive fish. In my opinion, electrofishing is random, and it's better because then you can select for fish that you know that are underweight and return fish that are overweight. Where by angling, it bit the hook, and that means they're pretty aggressive, but as long as they're underweight, you can do it by fishing too. The downside to electrofishing is it costs money. Well, you know, so does a truck. <laughs> so, does, uh, so does the fishing rod. So it kind of depends on your level of, of management. Dustin Powell, he's at church tonight, but he sent me this question earlier today. He said, on your topic of bass and what they do, I'd like to hear how clear water affects their actions. How can we use this info to become better fishermen? Not going to be able to watch live, but I'll look forward to seeing it afterwards. Well, largemouth bass are sight feeders. That's how they'd rather do it. They would much, much, much rather see to eat. You know, like I said earlier, the lateral line detects movement. So even if there's something going on, let's say there's a school of threadfin shad that's 40 feet away and they're moving in unison all around through the water. You guys that, that, that do this much, you've seen threadfin shad flush. You've seen them run in big schools. Well, when they do that, that bass that might be 40 feet away can sense the movement by the vibration coming through the water. So what they'll do is they'll investigate. So they'll move toward that movement and then as they get to it, when they can see it, that's when they instinctively decide to eat it. Or if they see that that big school of fish they thought was shad is actually a great big bass bigger than they are, then they can flee from it. But yes, they, in, in clear water, it's, they can see a lot better, which means you have to have a little bit more stealth and you have to have a little bit more um, presentation tactics to catch the bigger fish, especially. Chris Chavetta, when do you electrofish 
harvest. See, when you do electrofish harvest, should you remove green sunfish as well? Any other species? You know, that's a good question. Um, the way that I look at fisheries management is we sit down with each landowner and figure out the goals. And then we figure out where they are. We come up with a game plan. And now when, when I say figure out where they are, that may mean electrofishing and find out what fish they've got, which ones they don't, which ones they're missing, which ones they need. And then we make that choice. So what may be great fish in one lake may not be such great fish in another. So if, if it's a case to where we want to remove green sunfish, do it, sure, do it when you're electrofishing. That's a good time to do it. Uh, you know, we got a bunch of new folks coming on. If you will, if you will type in hashtag Pond Boss Magazine, click like on this video and share it, your name goes into a hat for a hat and a video. As a matter of fact, and in, 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 I may toss in a copy of Pond Boss Magazine. As a matter of fact, I will if you don't get it. Just, you know, when, when Leanne does the drawing, Jacob West won it this last week. So, uh, and also, have your friends subscribe to the magazine because there's a, you talk, think this is fun. There's a lot of stuff in every issue of the magazine. Let's see here. We got um, Kevin Briggs. Uh, do bass in a pond get conditioned to stay in the middle of the pond to stay safe? You know, you know, I, I don't think they get conditioned to stay in the middle of a pond to stay safe. Here's what bass do. We've, we've got a, a study that's ongoing that we're, we're learning a lot of stuff about. Speaking of South Dakota State, they're the ones that we worked with to help start it, and they've pretty well taken it over. There's a lake in East Texas where we have radio tagged about 40 bass. And those radio tags last about 18 months. And we've, we've tagged these fish in stages. You know, started off with like 18 or 20 and then added more. The thing that's uh, really, really interesting to me is how those fish behave, especially in the summer and in the winter. Hey, Bob Wisher. There's Don Winterout and Brandon is on. Dusty Luton with uh, the Whitesboro Fishing Club is on board. So what happens with these bass that are radio tagged is we're studying their movements. It's, a, it's pretty amazing because there's a couple of things that, I mean, as, even as long as I've done this, I had no idea that bass did this. It's, it actually floored me. I, would, I think I said last week when I was telling a little bit about this story, I would have bet a steak dinner against what I'm fixing to tell you, but it's the truth. These fish with the radio tags, some of them are moving. There's one bass in particular that weighs seven pounds in a 125-acre lake that moves two miles every day, summer, winter, and it's not like it's running a trap line. It's going from there to there to here to here, and there's just no method behind it at all. And it may sit off of a point for four hours and then move 200 yards and sit there for an hour, and then it may move again and again. And conversely, there's another bass in that lake that's about three pounds that never leaves an area bigger than a football field. You know, so these different fish genetically and by their conditioning in that particular lake or your lake can be, their movement's going to be different. You know, instinctively, I think that bass want to stay close to cover, habitat. Like a big bass, its, it's favorite place to be is in fairly shallow water off of a point with access to quick, uh, deep water next to some kind of structure, whether it's a drop-off or a log, you know, or a rock pile or whatever. That's where the big fish really like to be. That's what they choose. Now, in this particular lake that we're studying, the habitat was old, so it was gone. And we'd added some brush piles in there maybe 10 or 12 years ago, and they deteriorated and they were gone within about six years. So studying those bass, we started adding some habitat to the lake. And when we did... Some of the fish that moved quite a bit reconditioned coming to the habitat. While there were others that even though the habitat was, was increased a lot, they didn't change their conditioning. They kept moving. I remember one story. There was a, a guy out of Houston that, that bought some property and wanted to build a lake. And part of his conditions is he wanted some big bass. Well, we went and got some big bass, two great big ones, out of a muddy lake. One of them was 13 and a half pounds. And uh, as we moved those fish into his new lake, the next two or three years, they deteriorated. They were conditioned to those muddy waters off that big ranch. And when we put them in that clear water, they didn't know. 
They couldn't change. They'd been there for a long, long time. Hey, I see you, Scott Lindsay, Lance Farber, Blake Wilson, Whitesboro guy. Glad to see you, Blake. Carrie Cooper Wood. Hey, Carrie. Thanks for joining up with us. The, um, um, I, you know, the next thing I want to go is, um, how does temperature affect fish? You know, some of those fish that we tagged, one of the things that fascinated me that I would have bet against is in the summertime in this particular lake, and this is going to hold true for your lakes as well. In the summertime, when the water temperature gets really, really hot, bass don't like heat. They don't like cold. They don't like heat. What they like is water temperature somewhere between 55 and 85 degrees. Let me tell you a story. Um, this was back in, I think, 2004. I got called to come help develop a fishing program in upstate New York between Rochester and Syracuse for a man out of Syracuse, New York. Well, they had like five or six lakes there. And my charge was to help people enjoy the fishery. So when I was brought on board, I thought I was going to go there to help them grow more fish. But it didn't take long to figure out that that wasn't the problem. The problem was that people couldn't catch fish. So we started working on some plans to, to, to hire some guides and bring in some good equipment, you know, so that people could actually go enjoy the fish. But in the meantime, the owner challenged me with this. He said, he said, okay, pond boss, Lusk, I want to raise some bass bigger than eight pounds. Well, I kind of got conditioned in my mind that their growing season was too short. So I'm thinking, okay, how are we going to take fish that, the biggest one I've seen in the, any of these lakes around here was six and a half pounds. So how are we going to grow some eight pound bass? So what I started doing was I started calling some biologists. I called biologists. I called fisheries professors up there. And I called some hatchery people in the private sector as well as the public sector. And I asked the question. Matter of fact, I brought a bunch of them together and had a meeting. I said, okay, why can't we raise bass up to eight pounds or bigger in upstate New York? Well, every one of them said because the growing season is too short, the genetics won't work, and you can't get the food chain. So I started thinking about that. Okay, there's the box. You know, and we're all taught to think outside the box. Well, in order to think outside the box, you got to know what the box is. Well, there was the box. Well, I was thinking about that um, when I was coming home from the, the second or third time I'd been there. I'd go spend a week or two weeks at a time, sometimes a month at a time up there trying to help crack the nut. And uh, I remember I uh, was able to catch an early flight back up there one day. So I flew into Rochester and I rented a car and I called ahead and let them know I was going to be about four hours early. I was supposed to be there at 10 at night. I was going to be there around six o'clock. So one of the guys that answered says, hey, the chefs are, are going to have a wine tasting tonight. Well, I, I didn't drink wine. I didn't know anything about it. I was kind of fascinated just to learn about it. Hey, there's uh, Josh Flowers and Joshua Woods. Glad to see you guys on board. So I get there. There's my bride, Debbie Dobbs, Debbie Dobbs Lusk. I'm talking to him about the uh, wine tasting at Savannah Dew. So uh, I go in, and they've got this guy that owns the vineyard, and he's, a, he's also a sommelier and a winemaker. So this guy's an expert, and he's got six or seven wines that he's going to pair with different foods that the chefs have prepared there at Savannah Dew. Well, his mission was to try to sell them some wine because they wanted to serve New York wines. And he'd had a winery there in the Finger Lakes region of, of upstate New York, which is a beautiful country. And so he starts going through his, his spiel. And the story he told that just is impaled in my brain even today. He said, you know, when I bought this, this vineyard on the shore of the, one of the Finger Lakes here, he said, the first year, he said, my grapes bloomed later than what I was used to. They grew faster than what I was used to, and they matured faster than what I thought they should. So I called my mentor in Napa, and I told her what the bricks content was, you know, the sugar, the color, the acidity, how juicy they were. And she said, pick your grapes. He said, well, I don't, I don't quite follow. Tell me what's going on. She said, well, you know... Grapes need 125 days to grow of perfect weather. 
and you have those days, 125 of them in a row. Out here in Napa, we've got 125 days spread out over about 250 days of our season. So it takes longer. So I raised my hand. I said, hey, what's a perfect grape growing day? And he said, well, a perfect grape growing day is when the, when the temperatures are between 55 and about 85. I thought, oh my gosh, that's a perfect bass growing day too. So I went back into the National Weather Service records and started tracking all the data I could find for that part of the country. And sure enough, they've got about 125 perfect bass growing days in upstate New York. Guess how many you've got? Guess how many we've got? We have 125 perfect bass growing days spread out over about 300 days. Now what they don't have is they don't have bluegill growing days. We've got bluegill growing days Though our, our weather's perfect for bluegill production, probably 350 days out of the year, 330 days out of the year. So it wasn't growing season at all. It was food chain. So when we started focusing on the food chain there, two things happened. They had a bunch of small hatchery ponds on this 5,000 acre preserve. We started raising a bunch of bait fish and just transferring bait fish to feed the bass. And then we brought in some fish that had superior genetics. And it wasn't long, I think two years, two and a half years, we had some bass up over eight pounds. And it's, it was had to do with giving them enough food and conditioning them with the way we fed them. We, did, we would come in once a week or twice a week with, with bait fish to feed them. Uh, even working with Mark Cornwell from uh, SUNY Coble Skill, he was raising tiger trout. We'd buy some of those tiger trout about that big to feed the biggest bass in these lakes. And it worked great. So... Looks like we got Jerry Olert and Jessica Frost. Hello there. Jerry Olert is one of the very, very best videographers I've ever met. Uh, go to his Facebook page if you're interested in making a video because he is the very, very best. So let's see here. Bob Wooster says, what does it mean when they say your pond flipped, which is what caused your fish to die? Well, when a pond flips, this is part of where I was going to go a while ago, so this is a good segue into that. When the water flips... The, the nature of water, the physics of water, when water's 39 degrees, it's the densest that it can be. It's the heaviest. So in the summertime, coming up here in a, a few months, as our water temperature starts to go up, our days get longer, so it's sunny longer. We get more heat pushing into the water. When the heat pushes into the water and the wind and, wind and waves mix it, then that heat gets stuck in that part of the water because as the water warms up, it expands, gets lighter. So that heat wants to rise in that case. So what happens is the wind and the waves and the sun can only push the heat down so far, then you wind up with a layer cake effect. You have a layer of water here sitting on top of a cooler layer of water here. This is warm, this is cool. In the middle, the transition is called the thermocline. So what happens when your pond flips, it's when those two layers of water equalize in the temperature and then they mix which is normal in the fall for most lakes. Now, here's the significant thing about bass behavior on the topic, is in the summertime, what we found from these tagged bass over here in East Texas at that 125 acre lake, what we figured out was that those bass go down in the thermocline and they sit there. Now the water above the thermocline, the thermocline is that layer where the water transitions from this warm temperature to these cold temperatures. Below the thermocline, there is zero oxygen by the middle of the summer. So fish can't go down in that cooler water and survive. They'll suffocate. So what they do is they'll go, and this is to answer the question about fish moving out into the middle of the pond to be safe. They move out in the middle of the pond because they're looking for a better temperature. And the better temperature is that temperature between 55 and probably more like 55 and 82 or 83. Once it gets warmer than that, they're struggling. It's, it's what they don't like water temperatures that are hot. So what they'll do is they'll migrate down into that layer of water that's between, you know, that thermocline. That's where they're going to go. Now, what's interesting about that is we've checked that thermocline when those bass are sitting in it and the oxygen goes from maybe five or six parts per million above the thermocline and that good, fertile, vibrant, healthy water and it goes to zero below, but in the thermocline, it may be three parts per million oxygen, but it might be five degrees cooler. Hey, Jared Caffey, Colin Pearson, Timothy Phillips, glad you guys are on board. 
Timothy, I see you've got a uh, a question. We'll tackle that here in a minute. That's kind of an interesting question. So what happens is those bass get in that thermocline and they just sit there because they're trying they're seeking cooler temperatures than that hot layer on top of them in the summer. So they would much, much, much rather have their ideal temperature than oxygen, which I wouldn't have bet that. I would have lost that steak dinner bet if we'd have made that bet four or five years ago. Because I would bet you they would get down to the thermocline but not get in it. But that's what they do. Now think about their behavior when they're in the thermocline. They're trying to be cool, so to speak, not suffocate, but they're also not active. Now the reason a fish will go out into the middle of a pond is because it doesn't have structure that it can orient to in the thermocline. Okay, now that's a pretty important deal. Think about that a minute. If you've got bass that are um, sitting in the thermocline and they're complacent, they're not asleep, they're just not, not moving. If you want to try to find them in that thermocline, what better place to find them than around some kind of structure? So if you've got structure or cover that's like a rock pile or a, that's why Bill Dance tells me he likes to fish underwater humps. He likes to go out in, in the middle of a lake in the middle of the summer. Kentucky Lake is the one he was telling me about when we talked about that that time. And he goes out and he finds that underwater hump that's above the thermocline in deeper water. And he'll start working that hump trying to find fish to entice them to get a reaction strike out of, out of them or make them defend where they are. So, you know, in, 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 in the summertime, if you're going to try to catch a fish in the middle of the day, you'd be looking toward the thermocline where there's structure. And you're probably going to do a little bit better. Um, I got to listen uh, to um, oh, a famous angler, Hank Parker, talking the other day on a video I watched where he was talking about um, fishing in the wintertime, like right now. Well, he goes to the bottom and fishes really, really slow. And you're going to catch more quality fish than you are quantity fish. So fishing it really, really slow down close to the bottom because those fish are going to be oriented toward the bottom this time of year, but they're going to be complacent. You've got to give them a reason to bite. Okay, so Timothy Phillips says, see a deer fell through the ice near the aerator hole and is floating dead, and it's about a one-acre pond, 12 feet deep, with no water running through it. Do I need to get the carcass out? Yes, you do. Uh, you need to get the carcass out because as it decomposes now, if you've got ice, you understand safety. So... You know, here, here's what I'm going to tell people about that. I'm going to change the topic. Aerating a pond this time of year, you really need to have a specific purpose for that. And what I tell people to do, if you want to aerate your water this time of year, move your diffuser up closer to the shore and aerate, uh, aerate shallower water and keep a hole open by the shore rather than in the middle. Because if you can do that and an animal gets in or a person gets in, they're going to be more likely to be able to get out. Now, here's the reasons not to aerate in the wintertime. The main reason to not aerate is because now your water temperature is going to be autonomous from the top to the bottom. If you're not aerating and you're, you have ice cover, the water at the bottom is going to be about 40 degrees, 39 degrees, because that's the heaviest water. And if you're aerating, your water could be 32 point one, you know, and it's not freezing because it's moving. So now you've got that really cold water from top to bottom, which is stressful for most pond fish, even cool water fish and even cold water fish like trout. They don't really like it that cold. So a reason to aerate under ice is because you've got a lot of aquatic plants going into the winter time, or you've got a heavy plankton bloom and you're worried about winter kill. If you want to prevent winter kill, then aerate. So the next thing I would do, the next time I would, you know, next winter, I'd bring that diffuser in closer to the shore so you're not aerating in the middle, you're aerating along the shore. Then you're still going to have that deeper, warmer layer of water that you're not impacting with your aeration, but you can also keep some air going into the water in the shallower areas and minimize the risk of a winter kill. Let's see here. Colton Hensley, Bob Wisher. Turnover is the mixing of levels of pond water caused by the changing of the temperatures at the, of the surface water. 
This occurs, okay, so yes, yes, that's true. Now, the thing is also about a turnover, it can also be chemical. There, I've seen chemical turnovers. In other words, when you've got a high production of fish going on, say a pond that's being fed, well, there's a lot of fish waste being given off. All that fish waste is heavier than water, whether it's liquid waste coming out from a bladder or if it's solid waste or even if it's gas coming out of the gills. You know, once that saturates the water and sinks to the bottom, that water density changes. So I've actually seen that water migrate to the surface when it's got more fish waste or detritus or organic matter waste in it. And when it gets to that point, even in the wintertime, there could be a turnover in the wintertime. You know, so yes, Colton Hensley, you're correct. There's a little more to it than that. Colt, uh, let's see, Colin Pearson says, would you pull the aerator on the one acre pond in the winter? Well, I don't know that I would pull it. You know, the explanation I just gave about that pretty well covers that. I think my question, I'm getting to read it a few minutes after you post it. Billy Birch is on board. Hey, Billy has everything in Southeast Texas, man. Hope things are well. So, need some more questions. You know, a little bit more I wanted to talk about is, um, how about barometric pressure changes or the salunar tables? <laughs> I think the best explanation I've heard, and one that I buy into about the salunar tables is that, does it affect the way fish feed? Yes. Are there peaks of feeding? Yes. Now, keep this in mind. When a, a bass eats because it's hungry or because it senses something is changing, you know, um, like pre-front, before a front blows through and the barometric pressure is dropping, fish go into feeding frenzy because they can sense it with their lateral line, which sends a message to their brain that instinctively tells them that they need to eat. So at that point, you'll see a lot more fish feeding more aggressively. Now, the, on the other hand, there may be a school of fish sitting there and only one of them's hungry. That one will go eat. Now, with fish behavior, it's pretty interesting because the little bitty fish feed differently than the medium-sized fish, which feed differently than the bigger fish, which feed completely differently than the great big fish. A great big bass, a double-digit fish, it feeds, it's the king of the hill in the pond or lake that it lives in. That 12-pound bass, 13-pound bass, can eat pretty much anything else that's in that pond. So it doesn't have to work as hard. It's got abundant food. Whereas in that same pond, all those 10 to 14 inch bass, they're competing against each other. They can't eat big food. They have to eat little food. So they're like gang members, man. They're on the prowl. They're chasing everything down. They're getting whatever they can get and they're pillaging it. You know, where the bigger the fish gets, the more selective that they are about what they eat. Hey, Mark Sanders, hello. Billy Birch is doing good, bud. <laughs> That's cool. So think about the size of the fish and you can begin to understand their behavior. Here's something, here's a take home point for you. A 17 and a half inch bass in your pond becomes the dominant predator because their mouth is about so big and a 10 inch bass can fit in its mouth. That's when a bass starts becoming helpful to you to call your bass. Now keep in mind that that 13 and a half inch bass, I mean um, 17 and a half inch bass, weighs about three, three and a quarter pounds. You know, so that's about the magic number. Three and a quarter pounds is about the magic number. If you can get your bass up to that size, then you're going to have a fish that can make a living in, in that body of water. Let's see, uh, Victor Moberg, is it too late to fertilize this winter? Central Texas. Yes, it is. You don't need to fertilize right now. Everything's dormant. Um, to kind of take that question a, a little deeper, what fertilizer does is you mix it into the water column to promote the growth of microscopic plants and animals called plankton. Well, plankton doesn't really start to grow until the water temperature's in the mid-50s, the lower 60s. So once your water temperature is is 55 and going up, then think about fertilization. Now, I'm not telling everybody, I don't want anybody in Minnesota to run out and fertilize a pond before you do some homework. You know, because you've got this little thing called wintertime, where people south of the Mason-Dixon line have this little thing called summertime, 
Well, summertime is better for fertile water than wintertime is better for fertile water. So I'd be picky about it. The, uh, uh, just the direct answer is don't fertilize in the winter. Wait until the water temperatures are rising and if the visibility is too great. Because what you want to do with fertility is you want to put fertilizer in the water to promote the plankton, which colors the water green. Well, when you have green water, what you're doing is you're creating the food chain for those newly hatched little fish. Remember those fish I was telling about earlier in the broadcast? When they first come off the bed, those little bitty fish, when they absorb that yolk sac, the egg, what used to be the egg yolk, once they absorb that, they have no body fat, so they have to eat. So they have a little bitty mouth, so they can eat little bitty things. And so if your water's gin clear early in the spring when spawns start to kick in, then your baby fish are not going to survive as well. That's the time to have fertile water. Now in the south, you don't want to have a real fertile pond when you get into the dog days of summer, late July and August. In the springtime and early summer is when you want fertility. Now the fertility does things more than just provide the food chain to help survival rates of your little bitty bait fish. What it does is it keeps the sunlight from penetrating any deeper than that balloon can hold. So if you've got visibility at 24 inches with a good fertile pond, you're not going to get runaway aquatic plants that you have to deal with. But if your pond's six foot of visibility, you're going to have plants growing in six foot depth. So I'd be paying attention to that. Let's see here. Dave Terry. Hey, Dave. Glad to see you. Brandon, are there any negative effects of using pond dye? Well, when you talk to the guys that manage golf courses, they say no. That stops algae. That prevents it. That keeps plants from growing. But if you have a fishing pond and you use pond dye, what you've done is you've stopped the uh, UV penetration from the sun and keeping that from growing the plankton that your baby fish need. So if, you're, if you want to grow fish, don't use dye. Now if, you, if, you, if, you, if you really know what you're doing, you can put some dye in this time of year just to prevent filamentous algae, but it needs to be dissipated by the time the fish start to spawn so you can have a plankton bloom kick in and start doing what it does to feed your baby fish. So let's see here. By the way, for everybody that's joined in, I see Rick Perkins is on board, Mike Rivers. What kind of fertilizer works best? I'll tell you about that here in a minute. Negative effects of using pond dye, we got that. So I want to remind everybody, if you will put hashtag Pond Boss Magazine, click like on the video and share it, that'll put you in a drawing for a Pond Boss hat and a Pond Boss mug. As a matter of fact, I'll throw in a copy of Pond Boss as well. And if any of you that are watching, if you haven't gotten Pond Boss, send me an email at info at pondboss.com. Give me your mailing address and I'll have Leanne send one to you. Our winner last week was Jacob West. He got a, a Pond Boss hat and a mug. So, just that little commercial there, and it's 35 bucks a year to subscribe to the magazine. It comes out six times. You get nuggets out of every one of them, I promise. I know the guy that writes it and puts it together. So, uh, Rick Perkins, good to see you. Kevin Briggs did it. Hashtag Pond Boss Magazine. Atta boy, Kevin Briggs. That boy, there's Mike did it. Brandon did it. Tori Rhodes. Hello, Tori. January, February mag was excellent. Well, thank you very much. It's got some pretty good meat in it, and we'd like to Share it with everybody. So, to go back, let's see. We had another question there, I think. What kind of fertilizer works best? Well, let's see. Mike, if I remember right, I think you're in Tennessee. So, over there, you're probably going to use a fertilizer similar to what anybody in the south would be using. So, that would be a, a fairly high phosphorus fertilizer. Now, if you live in Montana and you hear me say that, that's almost like a hanging offense for cattle rustling in Texas. But in Tennessee and in the south... We're looking, for, we're looking to add phosphorus to the water because that's the limiting factor to grow plankton in our ponds and lakes around here. Scott Lindsay, you mentioned algae. I seem to have a good bit in my shallow water now in South Carolina. Is this bad? You know, Scott, I don't think it's bad because you're not fishing in it. Now, if you're fishing in it and you're getting caught on it, then it could be bad. What I'm going to tell you is it's normal. It's normal to have algae especially in South Carolina. Now, we don't have that here because our water temperature's in the uh, low 40s. You know, I didn't check it today, but uh, last Thursday, my water temperature was 44 degrees, which is pretty darn close to fatal for threadfin shad, for example. So, if the algae's bugging you, it will ebb and flow. Typically, typically with filamentous algae, as the water temperature goes up, it dies back. But, if it overlaps when, when you're wanting to fish, you may want to do something about it. Now, algae, filamentous algae, 
grows primarily off of nitrogen that's in the soils, but it can also glean it from the water. Now our atmosphere is mostly nitrogen. So nitrogen is continually absorbing into the water to saturate it with as much as it can. So that's kind of the catch-22 with filamentous algae is it gets plenty of nitrogen. So there's a number of ways to, to treat it. You know, you can use an algae side, but keep in mind, <clears throat> here's the big deal about plants and filamentous algae is one of those plants. You got to have three things for them to grow. You got to have food, which you do in the bottom of the pond. You got to have the right temperature. Filamentous algae likes cool water more than hot water. And you got to have uh, sunlight. So you got sunlight, temperature, and food. When those three things come together, something's going to grow. And right now, in your part of the country in South Carolina, that's algae. So now, if you were to go treat the algae, keep in mind that you're, that you're treating a symptom of a problem rather than the problem. The problem is you got sunlight, you got food, and you got the right temperature. With any one of those changes, then the plants change as well. So let's see here. Victor Moberg says, a friend is to an half-acre pond has a bad duckweed for long periods of the year. How can you control it? Well, you know, probably, let's see, and I don't remember where you are, Victor. I'm going to tell you this about duckweed. Duckweed reproduces exponentially. Duckweed is one of those plants, that one in watermeal and some others, where it reproduces about every 24 to 36 hours. So you remember the old story if somebody says, somebody says, do you want a penny doubled every day for 30 days or a million dollars? Take the penny. Well, the duckweed is the penny. So how do you control it? Well, if you have much winter, it's going to freeze out. But that doesn't mean it's all going to freeze out. So coming into the spring, if it did freeze out, they can take a swimming pool net or something and dip out the small amounts there before it starts to go again. I think that's a smart way to do it. Now, if it's thick, oh, well, you're in Austin area. Okay, if you're in the Austin area, you know what? When they had, I mean, Austin had nine degrees last week. I'd go back and look. And if it froze out, that's good. If it didn't freeze out, starting about the 1st of March, there's, a, there's a, an enzyme-based herbicide called fluoridone that will take it out. But that's a catch-22. It can't be any water flowing out because that particular material has got to stay in contact with the plant. The material, the fluoridone is dissolved in the water. The plant takes it up, but it takes it about 90 days to die because it doesn't poison it. It changes its metabolism where it can't photosynthesize, so it starves to death. So that's a good way to do it. Okay, holy cow, we're knocking on the door at 7.30. Let me see if there's anything else I wanted to cover about um, bass behavior. Let's see. Visibility matters. We talked about that. Talked about the temperature impact. Um, radio tags. We talked about that. You know, one thing I've noticed about bass behavior, they move a lot more if they don't have the habitat that they can orient to. So bass get conditioned to that environment. And if they've got good habitat, places where they can hide, where they can reproduce, where they can congregate, then they're going to be less likely to move, and that's going to be the lakes and ponds where the fish get bigger. But if, they're, if, if a lake or pond is void of habitat, then they get conditioned to be able to move, and that's what they have to do because they don't have anything to orient to. It'd be like if you and I were dropped off in the Sahara Desert. Where are we going? Well, we don't know, but we're going because we're not sitting still. But if there's an oasis, well, that's where we're going, and that's where we're going to hang out if there's water and food. You know, and bass are kind of the same way. Hey, there's Roger Garner, my brother-in-law. Hey, Roger. Let's see. Todd Watts is asking a question here. Gene Gilliland. Hello, Gene. BASS Conservation Director. Glad you're here, buddy. Let's see. Um, Todd Watts. Bob, what about tilapia to control duckweed? Well, um, in theory, that's a good idea. But the problem is tilapia have to turn up and come feed like this because duckweed floats. Now, they'll eat it but I don't think they'll control it. I've had tilapia in ponds that have duckweed and the tilapia will control the algae, but they won't control the duckweed simply because it out reproduces their ability to pull it off the surface. And besides, if a tilapia can graze without standing on its tail, that's what it's gonna do. So in theory, it's a good idea, but in reality, it doesn't. Robert Deason, great show and info, thanks. 
Well, hey, you know what? It's about that time. It's 7.30. I want to remind everybody about Pond Boss Magazine. Here's some resources for you. If you go to pondboss.com, we've got lots of videos there. We've also got some um, articles that are free. We've got the Ask the Boss discussion forum where you can go join and ask questions to get some one-on-one -on -one help. And we've got our Facebook page. So uh, please join up and come hang out with us. We appreciate the shares because that helps build the audience. And that's what we're after. We want to appreciate it a whole lot. And Mike Rivers, thanks for the compliment. Everybody, thanks for tuning in. And, oh, hey, wait, guess what? Next next Wednesday, I called Mike Octo last week. I got two emails. Somebody said, hey, well, can you get Mike on? So next week, we're going to see if we can have a guest. And it's going to be Mike Octo, one of the nation's best lake builders. So uh, thanks for checking in. And we will see you guys next week, 6.30 on Wednesday, Central Time. See you later.